of God we serve. He's on time. Amen. Isn't he on time for you? Yes. I always say, God's always on time. He scared me a few times. <coughs> but he never let me down. Amen. Amen. Well, today we are kicking off a new series, and this is going to take us right into homecoming. Uh, I kind of, if you're looking for a series title, this is called uh, Leaving an Unstoppable Legacy. Because if we're going to leave a legacy, we don't want it to ever stop, right? And kind of, Cheryl kind of alluded to that. You know, we have been in this area for 30, for 90 years. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to believe, but this year we're celebrating 90 years of being in Blanchard, Louisiana. That's, that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Matter of fact, in 1930, in 1930, the Reverend George <coughs> Jenkins organized a Nazarene church with 20 members. And that's this church here. I don't know if you know about the history of this church, but the church was located in an old grist mill. Interesting, huh? It was made comfortable with gas and lights installed by Mr. George Solomon. The church minutes reads as follows. On the night of November 19, 1930, Brother G.M. Aikens, uh, the district superintendent, Church of the Nazarene, Louisiana, was invited to meet with the congregation of Blanchard for the purpose of organizing the Church of the Nazarene. After the gospel message based on 1st John, uh, first chapter of John, the rules of the church were read and 20 persons were received into church membership. It wasn't long before a permanent home needed to be found. The church minutes read on the night of May 6, 1931, we carried our regular session of prayer meeting over to our new church. We left that small building presented to us for the use of service by Mr. E. L. Solomon. We, we leave with much regret, for the Lord has wonderfully blessed each and every person there. Each and every person expressed their thanks for the old building and sincere hopes for great times to be had in our new building. I wonder back then, if you think about that, more than almost 90 years ago, if those people could have envisioned this being right where we're at today. Well, you know they had to. Visions don't happen. Places like we're sitting in today, a church doesn't go 90 years unless somebody had a vision. It just doesn't happen. You don't see things happen in your life. You don't see things happen inside of a church. You don't see things happen unless somebody had a vision that one day this could happen. We're sitting here today because somebody, I don't know the history of this, I'm going to find out, but somebody looked at this piece of property and said, you know what, I can see a church there. And that's how a vision started. I read a story this one last week where they were doing a, uh, they were, it was the day that the Disney uh, World or Disneyland, I don't remember which one, that when it opened up, well, the guy that did it said, man, I wish Walt Disney could have been here to see this. And the guy that was the CEO, CEO, of, CEO of Walt Disney said, oh yeah, he saw it. Think about that. He saw it, and that's the reason it was there. you got to have a vision. And let me tell you what, I have looked over our history. I've been in this church for a good majority of my life, other than the times I've pastored in other places. I was blessed enough to be able to come back here and pastor almost 20 years ago, be 19 years next year. Almost 20 years I've been pastoring here. And I'm telling you, I've seen some pretty neat things. I grew up in this church. I spent most of my life here. I'm 56 years old, I think. Is that right? I'm 57. Something like that. Woo, yeah, I'm yeah, 56. That's it. Oh, man. Anyway, so I've been here for a lot of those years, you know, for more than, more than half of them. We've been part of this congregation, a part of this church. And, man, we have seen some great things happen. I mean, we've seen some great revival. We've seen people get excited. We've seen people shout. We've seen people run the aisles. We've seen people stand up in the middle of the service and just start crying. We've seen those days. Can I get an amen? Have you seen any of that? You know what? And I think that there's something special about that, and I think there's something great about that. And I just don't want that to die out. I don't want to lose that vision. I don't want to lose that excitement. I don't want to lose those revival fires. And if there's one thing that our church needs, it needs a revival. It needs a good shot in the arm. I mean, we, 
We've been a part of something for several months now, and if we're not careful, what happens is it, it can infect the church because it has. And I think we need a good booster shot or something. Amen. I mean, we need the Holy Spirit to show up. Yeah, I want to see a good Holy Spirit revival. Amen. I mean, the thing that you just can't hold back, you just have to get excited. You have to praise God. One of the scriptures that I have two that I'm going to really focus on today. And here's the, the today I want to talk about this is that, yes, we the only way you can have an unstoppable legacy is got to start with an unstoppable vision. And let me tell you, the only way we're ever going to make it another 90 years, you know, if this old world is still here, well, who knows, the Lord may have come back by then. But if he's, we're still here, I want this church to still be here. We, some of us won't be here. Some of us might. Amen. Some of you, the young ones, they still may be here. And that would be awesome. Now, I know a lot of us won't be. Amen. We just won't make it that far. But I hope the church makes it, right? I, I believe the only reason that we're here is somebody did leave a legacy. Somebody left a legacy for us to have, Right? And you know what? It's our responsibility. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility to take that legacy and continue it forward. We don't want the legacy to die in our, our history, right? We don't want to someday to look back 10 years from now and say, man, that church was on fire until 2020 and something happened to it. I don't want that on my watch. I don't, want to, I don't want to be a part of when I'm at this church. I want the church to still be alive. I want you to be still excited about being part of this church. Can I get a little bitty baby amen? amen? Because I think we can and I believe we can. Here's the scripture that was read a little bit earlier. and It's out of 1 Kings chapter, uh, chapter um, 18, verse 37. And here's what happened. Elijah... If you know his story, it's tremendous, tremendous story. And I don't know why God led me this to this scripture as I was praying and getting ready uh, for this series. And I just came to this scripture because Elijah is one of my favorite prophets. Amen. Anybody know who Elijah is? I mean, he is one awesome dude. I, I would love to be like Elijah, right? He's just a tough guy. But he's a real guy because he experiences what we experience. He went through depression, and he, he got frustrated. He's just like you and I, but man, he believed in God. He believed God could do anything. Wouldn't it be great if we still believed that? Remember, he's the one that came to the king and said, Hey, king, you, your people are so bad, we've kind of turned our back on God. God's about to put a drought on your country. And for three years, it was a drought. There was nothing to drink. And it, it was so bad that the king put out a ransom on his life and says, we're gonna, let's kill this guy. It's his fault that we're not having rain. So about three years later, he comes back. And I love the scripture. He comes back to the king. And the old king points his finger at, at, at Elijah and says, you troubler of Israel. And then what he did is he challenged them. He challenged them, hit their gods against his one God. And all these prophets got together. All these prophets of Baal. All these false prophets, they got together, and they were, going to, they were going to have a contest up on the mountain, right? And they were going to call on their God. So all the prophets got together at Baal, and they, were, they built a big fire, and they were said, okay, if your God is real, let him come and put the fire out. And sure enough, you know the story. I'm telling you something you already know. But go through it sometimes and look at it. He, they began to pray, and they prayed all day. They screamed out to their God. They even had one part in there that says, you know, uh, Elijah is in their face. And he said, hey, what's wrong with your God? Is he in the bathroom or something? You need to read it in his soul. It is amazing. And they began to cut themselves because they thought if they cut themselves and injured themselves, their God would show up and nothing happened, no fire at all. After they got finished, Elijah said, hey, okay, now it's my turn. It's my God's turn. And you know the story. Remember, they're in a drought. And what he did is he built this big altar, right? Built this big place, and he built this, this big ditch around it. And what's so amazing, he said, fill that thing. Let's, let's just soak this thing. Pour all the water. And they're in a drought, and he's telling them to put this water on. And they drenched the pot. I mean, they drenched this big pile of wood. It was so much that they had a big thing of water all around it. And he prayed out to God, God, you come and show them. And God showed up. And the Bible, the Bible says he came in such a way, the fire consumed the big pile of all, the altar that was there. And it, sucked, it dried up all the water all around it. And let me tell you what, that's a God. 
And we need a God like that because sometimes we look around and we think the gods that were around us are so much bigger. We think the problems that we're having in America, the problems we're having in our world, the, the problems we're having in our own world are so big that we can't do nothing about it. But I'm telling you, the God we serve is still the God of Elijah. He's still the God that was in the New Testament. And he's still the God. You may not believe. How many believe that God can still do that? I believe it. Do you believe that God can come and have a great revival in our church? And at the end of this, here's what he prayed. Look what he said. That's why I brought you, because I want you to see what Elijah prayed to God. He said this. He says, Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that these people may know that you are the Lord God. And that, that needs to be our vision. That needs to be the vision of the Blanchard Church of the Nazarene. Then when people do drive by, when they talk about the Blanchard Church of the Nazarene in our community, they know there's a God. I want them to do that. And he said this, he says, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. I love that scripture because it's not so much that God's turning back to them, He's getting them to turn back toward God. You know how we're going to have revival? You know how vision's going to help the church? Is when we quit looking at all the things that are going on around us. Quit worrying about things that we can't control. And start looking toward the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Elijah, the God that sent Jesus into the world. When we get focused on Him, God can do and will do great things. So how does that happen? Let me give you four things real quick. How do we have an unstoppable vision in the world that we're living in? It's easy to look around and we say, man, what is happening? We're kind of low today. That's okay. It doesn't matter who's not here. All that matters is he's here and you're here and guess who else is here? Boom, it is God. God is in the house. Amen. Do you know the advantage you have today? You've got God right there by you ready to show up in a great way. What is it going to take? I think, first of all, we, the only thing that we can do with our legacy that's been passed to us, your, your, your kinfolk have passed something to you. Somebody told you about Jesus, Amen. didn't they? Somebody told you about how Jesus can make a difference in your life. Somebody passed that on to you, and somehow you grabbed a hold of it and said, man, I want that God. Right. And then he got up in you, and it changed you, right? What they did is they passed a legacy to you. And that legacy was a very spiritual thing. They passed God on to you. The question is, what are you going to do with the God that's been given to you? What are you going to do with the spiritual legacy that has been laid in your life? The life-changing thing that's happened to you. Are you just going to sit on it? Are you going to be something that's just not moving? Are you going to be a light on the hillside? A salt of the earth? That's what God's asking you today. That's what He's asking our church. Are we just going to say, yay, yeah, we made it up here, and we made it 90 years. Woo, woo, woo. Are we going to say, no, we need to turn our hearts back to God. We need to let our community know, not just Blanchard, but all of Louisiana. We want the world to know that our God is real. How does that happen? Well, I think, first of all, it's going to take a little bit of imagination. And what do you mean by that, preacher? Imagination let me tell you, when no vision ever starts without you begin to think in it and believe it, that it can happen. And what God has done for each one of us, He's laid out His Word of God. And I laid out the Word of God. And I know I say this all the time, and I know some of you are going to sleep, but you hear me preach it all the time. But I'm telling you, if you're not in God's Word, you are headed for destruction. And if you're not reading God's Word, shame on you. Wow, I got quiet on 
Let me tell you, if you're not reading God's word, you're missing out on the promises that God has given you. You're missing out on the direction of your life. Remember, the word is the light unto our path, right? It's the direction it shows us. And man, if we can see what God can do in us, we begin to vision, right? We can see what God can do. And we don't see ourselves as somebody that's totally being beat up. We see ourselves as the child of God that can do all things through Christ that gives us the strength. Everybody say, hey, Amen. Amen. Somebody looked at your neighbor and said, Woo, I am glad I came today. <laughs> Amen. But some of that stuff comes from imagination. You've got to see yourself. I think what happens to a lot of churches, even, even churches our size, we begin to look at our church and we begin to say, Oh, we're just a small church. What can we do? Right? We look at our own life. And we say, man, look at the life that I've come from. Look at my past. What can I ever do for God? I'm going to tell you a whole lot more. Right? I want them to drive by our church and say, man, that's where God lives at. Even though we know he lives inside of us, I want us to leave that kind. I want to have that kind of image of God. That God can take this little bitty five, six guy that doesn't have much, but he's still got it going on and still believe that God can use me no matter what. Man, I can do all things. I'm telling you what, I am pumped up today. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I came to church. Woo! It takes, it takes Believing, imagination. Man, I can see it. I imagine myself there. Too many of us are imagining ourselves as being defeated, and that's the mindset that Satan tries to give you. If we believe this church can't do it, this church will never do it. Man, I can even imagine this. I mean, we can look around and say, man, this year has really hurt our church. It's hurt our attendance, you know. And we can start believing all this stuff. And I don't believe any of it, right? I don't. I don't believe that. But we can look at that. And then what happens, Satan comes in and sort of beats us up and we feel defeated. But I'm in here to tell you today, I can imagine us coming back here on year 100. I mean, 100 years in the Blanchard, right here in the Blanchard community. I can imagine us growing so big that we said, man, we got to expand out that way. We got to build a bigger sanctuary. We got to fill this place up. How many believe that? I believe that, church. I believe that. I may not be here. I may not be your pastor. But man, I can see God taking this right here and making something great out of it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Shake that little amen. But it does come down to that. Somebody looked at this blank ground and seen something happening. We've got to have that kind of vision. I was reading a history book this past week about travel to the moon. And it was one of the people that it talked about <clears throat> was James Irwin. Oh, I lost his last name. Is that right? James Irwin, yeah. If James Irwin, he it talked about when he was a little boy. His mom would always come in his room, right, at, at bedtime to put him, he was always looking out the window into the stars, looking up into the, 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 the starry night. And one day he looked at his mom and she says, son, I mean, his mom says, son, it's time to go to bed. He goes, mom, one day I'm going to travel to the moon. And we know he was one of the first men to do that, to step off and walk on the moon. you got to believe stuff like that. Why, why have we quit believing in the supernatural? Why have we quit believing that God can do anything? That God can take your life and do something great out of it? That God can take our church and still make a difference? That God can still come in here and set this church on fire with revival? Do we still believe that, church? Because once we lose that, it's over. We've got to believe that, but we've got to imagine it. We've got to see it. And hopefully once you see it, then it will inspire you. One of the things that, that Alicia read to you earlier was the Acts chapter 2, right? And the reason I had her read that was because that was the first church. And I love reading about that church because, man, I can imagine our church being like that kind of church. Have you ever read it? It's just amazing. 
I mean, I know there was a newness about it. I know we're nine years old, and we're ten times it feels like we're walking around on a cane because we're so old. But man, we're we're still kicking, eh, man? Come on, everybody smile one time. Woo! But you know, here this is a new church, man. There's a sense of newness about it. And I think we gotta have that, right? That's what inspires us. If we ever lose the newness of it, if we ever lose that sense that God has gotten old and He stopped moving, man, it's over. We gotta still believe in God doing great things. But I love that the Bible says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and everyone was filled with awe. Because what happened, guys? Wouldn't it be neat, church? Look up here. This is so awesome, right? You gotta, you gotta imagine the church. You gotta imagine. You gotta have that imagination. But then it should inspire you, right? You gotta have some inspiration. And what happened? You know what made this church so amazing is because they showed up at church just believing God was gonna do something. So let me ask you, church, this morning, how many? Got up this morning and says, man, I'm going to church because I know something's going to happen there today. Good, like, yeah, we have a couple that are willing to raise their hand and say, man, I believed it, right? But wouldn't it be great if every single one of you walked in here and said, man, I just, I'm going to church and I'm going to be in a sense of awe because I believe that God's going to show up. Let me tell you what, that kind of inspiration will bleed on to other people. When they, when they see you, like, man, what is going on here? That guy showed up, fired up today. What is wrong with him? It's probably because you know, he's got Jesus all up in him, and he's trying to spill some of it on you. Amen. And some of y'all probably need it today. I wish I had spill it on you and put it all over you today. Amen? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. But that's, that was what was neat about that church. They came at all. They were expecting something to happen. And guess what happened in the midst of their expectation? The Bible says, because they came with pure expectation, many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the prophets. By the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. Selling their possessions and God goods. They, had, they gave to anyone that they had need. Now don't freak out. I'm not going to ask you to go sell everything and give it to the church, right? I, that's not what it, I'm here for. But what I'm saying to you, wouldn't it kind of neat that when God showed up, they came in awe. They believed. Man, they were inspired. They, they had this, this image of God showing up, and man, they were inspired by that. And they came to church in awe. Man, they were, they were before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They hadn't forgot that. They believed that God was going to be there, and they wanted to be a part of that. And when they believed, God did many wonders. He did miracles in their midst. How many of you today would love to see God show up like that right here in our church? Man, there'd be great wonders, great miracles. And you notice, I think the, the core of this scripture here is not so much that they sold everything. What it, I believe what it's saying is this. They weren't concerned about themselves anymore. They were concerned more about the people that were around them. It's like they had a tremendous mental, I don't know, a reverse. It wasn't about them anymore. It was about the people that were around them. And they were together. They were as one. And, the, and what amazing is that there was a revival. And then the Bible, the Bible teaches right here that what happened, God began to add to their church daily. Matter of fact, they were having so much fun, they wanted to be in church. All the time. Thank you, Jim. I know it's hard for you to like me. I'm having a hard time just coming on Sunday. What's going to come? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? What if God tells you to come on? Right? But they didn't care about that. They didn't have to worry about staying home watching until their favorite show was on. They were at church because their favorite God was going to show up. Can I say that? Amen. Amen. Wouldn't it be great? Then you see the light came on me and that was pretty amazing. I'm telling you, God's in the place today. I think God's showing us, man, if we just had a little bit of imagination, man, if we, had, if we were just inspired enough to be in awe of God, 
And God said, man, that's what I need. I need a platform like that that I can show up. That I feel welcomed by my people, by my sons and daughters. And I feel welcomed and I can come into that place. And they won't be there. And God just shows up. I think there's something about that. That we become a church, man, that we're willing to, to invite people, right? One of the things I was going to challenge you to do today is this. You know, I think we ought to be so excited that God's going to be here that willing to invite people to church. And I think, I was going to say you ought to invite three people, but I'm going to just say you can only have to invite two, <laughs> right? And I think it'd be great if you went out this week and said, you know what? I'm going to invite two people to come to church with me. Because you know what? That's what I'm supposed to be doing. I, I want people to know. Because let me tell you, the, one of the main missions of our church, and it should always be, is to make, make disciples of people. Because that's the last thing Jesus told us to do, church. I'm leaving now. But here's what I want you. I want you to go and make disciples. And I leave all my authority and all my power with you. You've got the Holy Spirit with you that comes alongside of you. And I give you the power to do all things. You can stand on the foundation to go and do a church. And you ought to do that. I mean, how many people know one person that doesn't go to this church? Great man. How many know two people that don't? Yeah, surely you know somebody. And if you invite, I'll tell you what, I'm going to challenge you to invite two and I'm going to invite ten. Okay? So that way you'll say, man, I've got to get at least 10 because the preacher's about 10. And what am I going to do, right? Tommy, so I'm challenging you to do that because that's who we are. How are we going to get people to God unless we invite them here? I always thought of it like this, church. It's kind of neat, right? So and this is a great way to think about our church. We have a front door, right? We have a sanctuary and we have a fellowship hall. To me, the front door represents you inviting people to church. It does. That's, that's the key, right? Is to get them to the front door. How are we going to go into the future? Well, we got to have people to take us with us. Amen. God's going to bless and honor that. So the front door, always remember, represents me trying to get somebody to the front door. The sanctuary is where we kind of come and we learn about God, right? I mean, we want to get them in here so they can find out about God. They can learn about God. That's what happens here. We don't, we don't get to visit a lot, but we can learn about God. And hopefully somebody gets excited. Somebody feels the presence of God. Somebody feels it inside and say, ooh, I like that. Amen? Yeah. But the fellowship hall, ooh, it's a whole different ball game. I'm trying to get you out of here and get you into the fellowship hall. Because something sweet happens in the fellowship hall. Right? I don't know if you've ever been to the fellowship hall, but that's where we get to eat, right? That's where we fellowship together. And let me tell you, one thing I've learned over the years I've been here, this church likes to fellowship. They like to eat. And I praise God all the time that God put the best cooks right here in this church. Amen. I'm not talking about Shane Cook. I'm talking about the cooks, right? Amen. Oh, we appreciate the cooks coming to church here. But isn't it great that God blessed us with that? But something happens back in the fellowship that can't happen in here. Man, you begin to sit down together. You dig a little bit deeper and you find about somebody's family. You talk about, you know, the things they're going through. You find about their struggles. And you find out, man, we kind of have a lot of things in common because I've been there too and I know how you feel. Something happens in the fellowship. Something happens in that. And to me, that's what I hope happens, that we can get people in the sanctuary, but hopefully we can make them a family member, right? That we are a family. Guys, I think that one of the things we need is we've got to imagine that God can still use a bunch of person now. That 90 years in the future is not a problem for us. Because I have been left a great legacy, and I'm just going to take that legacy and I'm going to pass it on. God's done something good in me. Woo! He, he, he done something real good in me. Amen. I mean, God got a hold of my heart. Come on, church. Man, he got a hold of my heart, and then he got a hold of my feet, right? Then he got a hold of my hand. Don't make me get excited today. Something happened inside of me. And I don't want nobody in this world to miss what I got. I'm going to pass that on, right? I'm going to pass it on to other people. Because right? I'm inspired. And I hope, and I hope that that inspiration will get you involved and get you saying, hey, I want to be a part of that congregation. I want to be a part of those people. And what happens is this. 
I believe if we, if we can just let God give us a revelation, and what I mean is this, that if we can be, and if we can get, if we can just imagine who God is, and who we are through God, somehow that inspires us. And what happens is when you're inspired, then all of a sudden you let God begin to work in you. And I'm going to tell you what will happen. The blame for church and Nazareth is going to happen with God. And if there's one thing I would love to see happen, is when we begin to realize that we need the Bible. I was reading <coughs> this week about a church, I mean about when the people first moved here <coughs> from the other countries, and they one of, the, one of the first things they did is when they got here, they decided, let's, let's build a community. So this group of people, it was so awesome, they just traveled 3,000 miles in a new land. And they got together and they said, let's get together and let's form a community. And they did. A little bit later, they formed a government. And then it became a little town. Just, just people together. Well then, somebody in one of the meetings said, hey, let's, let's build a road out into the wilderness. Let's build a, let's, let's don't just, let's go out and, and move forward. So they said, let's build a road for, they built the road four, four miles out of the wilderness. People started freaking out, saying, what are we doing that for? <clears throat> then they overturned the government and, and fired all the people that were in, in the commission and said, we're not going out anywhere. We're right here. We're not, we don't have the vision that something can happen out there. We don't believe it. We're going to stay right here. I think the danger that is they were willing to travel 3,000 miles to start a new place. And they were, they were afraid. That next generation was afraid to go three miles into the wilderness. I don't want that to happen in my life. I, I would hate that to happen in the church. Somehow, somebody had a vision that they'd move out of a little grist mill and then move into one place and then move over here across the tracks. Remember when we used to be right there and we used to have that church and then somebody had a crazy vision. Hey, let's cross the tracks. There's a piece of land. And we all got together and we moved across, man. And now we're here and we're about to pay this crazy thing off. Somebody says, hallelujah. hallelujah. Yeah. And now, church, can you see it? He is, let's don't stop here. It would be so easy to say, whoa, wait a minute, we can't go any further. I like, I like the church. We don't want to grow anymore. Let's don't invite people. Let's just stay who we are. Won't God leave the church? That's the way to get him out. Man, we've got to be a church that's on fire. We've got to have an unstoppable vision. How do we have an unstoppable legacy? Pretty simple. You do it, you have an unstoppable vision. You imagine that God can use our church in a great way. We need revival. We need revival to come on our church. Hopefully, you allow God to let that revival come through you. Amen. Let's all stand as we go with this. And Father, we thank you so much for this time that we had today to be in your presence. Lord, thank you for the word that you've given us. Lord, for the vision that you gave those that were before us. Lord, how you passed that along to so many men and women that grabbed a hold of it. And now here we are all these years later. Lord, we're getting ready to celebrate 90 years of being in this community and being a part of Lynchburg. But the vision don't stop here, it continues on. Lord, there may be some here today. Lord, I don't know. I know sometimes I can fall into this. Sometimes, Lord, we see the things that are happening in our own life, and at one point we were sort of like that. There was a newness about it, and there was a fire about it. There was an excitement about it. Man, we couldn't wait to get into church. There was a sense of awe. We just came expecting God to do something. We came ready to receive from the Spirit. We just had that sense of, Lord, of, of, of just of believing and imagining God showing up and 
and being inspired to go out and do something. We used to be that. But I don't know, maybe something's happened. And sometimes it's hard to even get out of the bed and go to church. Sometimes it's hard to pick up my Bible and read it. Sometimes it's just tough to be able to pray, to motivate myself. And I've lost that sense of, of revival, that fire that I once had. And some of you may feel that today. I don't know. I know that I find myself there so often. And I'm asking you today to turn your heart back toward God. Just like Elijah prayed for his people, that God would turn their hearts back toward him, I pray that for you today. I pray that God will turn your heart back to Him. He is all you need. He is your fire. He's your very life, your breath. And I pray today that you do that. Well, nobody looking around. I, I just want to ask a quick question, because I want to be able to pray for you before we're dismissed today. Maybe God spoke to you today. Man, you need some of that. You need that that sense of uplift, you need that sense of fire, and you say, Lord, I need that, and Pastor, would you pray for me? I want you to raise your hand. Amen? Thank you. Thank you for all those hands. I want to pray for you. Because I know I'm, I'm there. Lord, I, I do lift up these ones that have raised their hands today, and they're asking you, Lord, to fill them up. To give that sense of fire. Some of that they may have lost. Something's happened in their life. There's things that are throwing them off and they just barely getting by. There's just a flicker there almost, not a fire, just a flicker. And it feels like it's about to get blew out. But today they came into your presence. Lord, they've heard your spirit move and speak into their heart. Lord, they raised their hands because they still believe in this God. If they'll just turn back to him, fall fully into your arms, God, they can find the help that they need. And we do pray for them. We fire them. Refuel them. Help them to be where you need them to be. Lord, help them to jump on board and say, man, I, I want to be a part of something great, a, a, a great movement of God. So Lord, I, I pray today for this congregation. I pray for each one of us. I pray selfishly for myself. I don't want to lose the fire. I always want to be on fire for you. So help me to be that way. Lord. Thank you so much for each one that has showed up. Thank you for your answered prayer. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.